Thank you all for coming. Uh, it's a full house. It's great. Uh, it's nice to see so many new faces here. Uh, usually, this institute is not open to the public, so we're really excited to welcome you here for this installation and this idea talk. Um, so, uh, as, uh, as it has been said, uh, we are trying to uh, promote quantum physics and try to engage the audience to talk about uh, quantum physics and science in general. Because the first thing that comes in mind when I tell people that I work with quantum physicists is a blank stare and <laughs> a scary look and like, oh my god, quantum physicist. Uh, and it's like, no, it's actually pretty fun. It's actually interesting. Uh, and this is going to be a proof of how interesting it can be. And so today I'm joined with uh, our first ever uh, artist in residence at YQI and visual artist, Martha Louis, uh, Willett Lewis. <laughs> And uh, quantum physicist and also YQI uh, board advisory member, uh, Michel Devore. Um, so before we, we start, I think we should address the art elephant in the room, which is the back. Uh, Martha, can you tell us what's in the back? And you've taken over the whole space, also the building the downstairs. Yes. So this is on, correct? Yes. Yes. OK, good. Um, so. It's back there right now. It's not turned on yet, partly because they're filming here and it has lots of motion sensors. And if it was on, it would be making quite a racket and responding. So it will be on after this is over and you can wander through it and really get to experience. So you're sort of seeing the outer shell of it, the, the husk of it. Um, how long should I talk about it? Um, so what was your influence and inspiration okay. about that? How so did, how it's, did these it's, it's, this come to piece life? is called I'll Be Your Cubit, and I wanted to make an interactive piece where the viewer could kind of experience some elements of quantum experiments, but also the culture of the place itself. And it's very much filtered through my experiences here as uh, artists in residence visiting the various uh, labs where they have um, these things called fridges, which are these super cold spaces where the experiments take place. Some of my drawings of the fridges are there. They have names like Goldie and Tennessee. Um, and they're very, very intricate. These are them when they're, when they're um, undone and getting ready for experiments. And when they're ready for an experiment, they get canned. And basically what you see is a cylinder. Luigi's sitting here nodding. Um, and so I have my, my installation basically creates a kind of very stylized fridge that you can walk through. You get to be the qubit moving through the experiment and the fridge. Um, and I want you to experience it for yourself, so I don't want to totally explain it all away, but, but it does react to you, and we'll be talking about how that, how that all works over the course of this conversation. So the, the installation is based on principle of quantum physics, and since we have a very diverse audience, I would like to take a few uh, minutes to uh, give you the, uh, the power and explain to us what is quantum physics. Do you have, do you have, do you have some sort of five minute speech that everybody can get? Don't tell me you weren't warned. <laughs> that will come up. Um, yes, at least I can try. So <laughs> That's your challenge. So I want to, before um, I start uh, launching into uh, quantum physics uh, ideas, I want to explain to the audience that there are certain ideas in physics that are actually better transmitted to the public through art than through equations. Often, in fact, in our papers, we, uh, we make drawings and uh, we even uh, employ artists to, to make these drawings. But here, Martha has created something unique uh, which allows you to experience um, quantum physics. And uh, quantum physics uh, is counterintuitive uh, even to quantum physicists. I'll, so, uh, I'll try to, um, I'll try to, um, uh, to transmit some, uh, some ideas. So, uh, quantum physics has at its heart a principle, which is called, uh, it's actually, we call it a principle, but it's a phenomenon. It's a principle of superposition. So what is, a, what are superposition in quantum physics? Well, if I take, um, let's say, this mug cover here, um, you see this object, which you can all see, um, in quantum physics, it could be in two places at once. It could be here or there. 
In fact, uh, you experience uh, nothing of the sort in your real life. Why? Well, let's take this room. Uh, it's flooded with light. This object is bombarded uh, by, um, you know, billions and billions of photons, and you are all catching these photons. You are all looking at this object. And it is your um, actually looking at this object that makes it in one place. If we could um, turn out the light, it would be very difficult. We would have to uh, suppress all the leaks. Uh, <laughs> if we could suppress friction on this object to an incredible degree, because it's a rather big object, so it, it uh, tends to, to uh, interact with everything, then it could be in two places at once. Of course, it's much more easy to do this with uh, something much smaller, much more <coughs> inconspicuous, like an electron. And that's the kind of thing we do in our experiment. But um, to experience um, the fact that um, something could be true, an event could be happening, and an, uh, an, an event which is actually completely opposite could happen at the same time, well, uh, this installation of Martha sort of recreates this idea. There is another fundamental uh, concept in quantum physics, which is the observer effect. Um, the fact that uh, when uh, you are uh, uh, doing a, an experiment, when trying to measure property, um, if it exists in, uh, in two, two states at the same time, so, well, uh, then you tend to uh, actually modify uh, the property. And this is uh, something you, you will be able to experience in this uh, installation, this observer effect. So, the observer effect has something a bit trivial um, to it, because uh, in everyday life, in our social interactions, when we uh, interact with people, we modify their mind. So. The fact that observing something modifies it is sort of trivial in a social situation. But what uh, quantum mechanics tells us is that even if you would make things absolutely perfect, even if you would interact with an object in the most um, perfect way, and if you would build an ideal instrument, well, you cannot uh, measure something without disturbing uh, that, um, uh, that uh, phenomenon. So that's... that's um, very in, in very uh, uh, loose words what the observer effect is in quantum mechanics. And that, that to me seems like a very, um, I think of that as a very postmodern condition where there is no such thing as being the impartial observer. It's like the fourth wall being removed from the theater where you as the uh, observer are part of the action and there is no way that you can, that, that you're not biasing the whole event. Um, the installation, as you'll see later on, uses very, very, I, I don't think I can use my, can you twirl this while I talk? Um, the, the, the installation uses um, early optical games and cinema, um, including Thomatropes, which is a 17th century optical toy where you can see um, both images simultaneously. Um, it uses, like a lot of my work, very, very simple materials to, exp to evoke uh, effects like both things happening at once, all things happening at once. And so, uh, as an artist, when you first came in uh, at YQI, so you came to give a talk in a non-technical series yes. about uh, art and science because your art deal with uh, science, history of science, mm -hmm. human knowledge. Ideas and um, physics, yeah. 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 What was the, did you have a shock when you came in and did you have to talk to <laughs> physicists? Yeah, well, okay, so I that? had a little bit of a taster. I had, I had gone to the Keck Futures Initiative in Southern California for an event and then I had been invited to give a talk at Cornell, which is how you thought of inviting me um, <coughs> to their physics department. And so I had had a little bit of a taste of it. Um, and I learned at that point that a lot of uh, scientists already are artists and that there's also something called sci art, which is definitely not what I do. Uh, sci art tends to be very polished um, reenactments of science. And my pieces are most certainly not polished and they're not a reenactment, they're very layered. They have lots of things that have to do with ideas in the past and different things that I kind of bring together into the, to the work itself. So they're definitely filtered through me. 
um, and yes, it was a shock here. It was uh, interesting and fun and exciting, and I've had an absolutely fantastic year, and I want to thank um, all of the faculty and all of the researchers and students here and all of the administration because this has been one of the greatest years, but it's also been really hard. I feel stupid a lot of times. <laughs> I really feel like I don't know what, what, I'm, what I'm hearing or doing, and, and I really have had to put myself out there in ways that are scary sometimes, but I've also really enjoyed it, and I, I kind of, I, I like not knowing, <laughs> not knowing things and trying to figure it out. I've been attending all of the Monday talks, um, and taking copious notes and trying to understand visiting labs. And one of the things that I've had to do is really take a very scattershot approach to talking to people because scientists are uh, many, many things, but, but very involved in what they're doing, very busy people. Um, some of them are shy. A lot of, uh, some people do experiments, but other people are pure mathematicians. And um, I think that, that makes it harder to explain what, what they're doing. Um, and at the same time, every day when I walk in here, the whiteboards are full of diagrams, and they've been cleaned up. I'm, I feel bad about that. But there's diagrams, and there's equations. And every time anybody's tried to talk to me about anything, the first thing they do is grab a marker and head to the whiteboard. And I watch students and researchers sitting there drawing and talking to each other. And that, that's exactly what artists do. Um, and artists also generate their own projects in the same kind of way, and we follow it in the same kind of way for the love of doing it more than anything else. Um, and I think that there are a lot of commonalities. So in some ways, I felt very alien, and in other ways, very at home. Michelle? Yes, I, I want to say we've been very privileged to have Ma Martha for, for a year. Um, so uh, one thing uh, I would like to mention is that Martha organized us some workshops, workshops um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, for us, on, for instance, uh, dealing with colors. So colors are very important uh, aspect well, of uh, scientific representation. In but only in terms of light. So the thing that interested me was that all of the, the color had to do with dealing with it purely as light, whereas a, as somebody trained as a painter, I was used to dealing with it as paint and material and matter, um, things that very much come out of the earth. I think that's the perfect time to talk about the other project. So this yeah. is the uh, the end project of residency, but you've been right. so much more. Can you talk okay. about remembering so, memory or yeah. quantum yeah, fluctuations? I'm going to talk about all of the things that I've done so far. But but I want to say about this. I think of this as an experiment, and this piece is specific to this room, which means that and this building, which means that I was not allowed to drill or nail or do any fix anything to it. And it's because it the YQA manager was not happy yeah, about right, that. Yeah, right. The YQA manager. <laughs> incredibly touchy. Uh, so it, it, this is sort of a prototype for something that I would like to keep working on. And it, and it was constructed rather hastily. I don't want to say hastily, because that's not right. I've been thinking about it a lot. But, um, but, it, but relatively quickly, because to build something of this magnitude, I would like you know, more, more time, I think. And one of the goals of the residency for me was not to end with, with a, a big installation, and here I am ending with a big installation. Um, I, I really wanted it to just learn and think and figure things out, because quantum things are really hard to uh, visualize and how to do that best. So I feel like this is an experimental version of this that I still kind of want to tweak. Um, but it started with the mural that's at the end of the hallway there, uh, Quantum Fluctuations. Which was a collaboration also with Michelle. With, which was a collaboration with Michelle. And it involved my crumpled paper pieces, which you can kind of see in the cases and images of them here, which have to do with um, ideas in physics as well. But they're, they're what I came, kind of came into the space with. And I made the large one that's in the case around the corner there um, for the institute and was going to put it on the wall. And Michelle said, no, it, it can't have any edges. Um, <laughs> and so we started to talk about why it couldn't have any edges and rework it. And I ended up with something that is really different than what I would have made on my own um, and what I had originally envisaged, which I think is 
absolutely fantastic. I was really quite nervous about it and photographing it as if you're getting up from the inside of it is uh, a, an approach that I had not thought of doing before. And so it really was through these conversations back and forth with Michelle that that, that became the way that it became. And even when we had it photographed, it still looked rather strange on the computer screen and the people who were printing it were like, what is this? And I had imagined what it would do within the space itself, the way that light would reflect on it and it creates kind of pools on the ground and it looks like it's lit from above because of the way the lighting is. But I didn't know for a fact that it was gonna be like that. So one of the exciting things about it was that as a piece of, um, not public art, but, but a permanent artwork installed in a space. Um, it wasn't, it, it really was also still an experiment, which I think is really good, because a lot of times things like that are not, this was not the safe option. So um, that is around the corner, quantum fluctuations, and Michelle wrote a, a beautiful caption for it, and you can get a postcard of it. But really, I think you have to see it with your body in the space because of the way that it, it um, alters the space itself. So that was my first project here. And can we talk about why you cannot have ages? Yeah. Because that's <laughs> one sentence I've heard yell from all the <laughs> right, right, like, right. no, no edges. edges. No edges. Martha was stressed because <laughs> brain actually, like all this crumpled paper, have love all these the beautiful edges. edges. I love the edges, yeah. And one yeah. of the reasons was like, no, no edges, chopped yeah. everything up. <laughs> so what is the, the reason behind? What is the idea? Well, it's, uh, I think uh, the reason why uh, physicists would like to have uh, no edges to some uh, piece like this, which would represent, uh, let's say, which would suggest what are quantum fluctuations, is that physicists are a bit obsessed with uh, one thing in nature, which is symmetry. Um, symmetry, things are, they are very attracted to symmetry. So if you take uh, something that has an edge, it lacks uh, symmetry. You're breaking the translational invariance of space. So. Um, so it's better if, for instance, um, um, the, the picture would be on a sphere. A sphere has no edges, has, has full symmetry. And so we did we, try we, to make one. Exactly. Yeah. So we tried. That was a project we did uh, mm -hmm. during the year. We tried to make uh, this kind of... It wasn't entirely a success. I'm still kind of figuring out how to make it really right, uh, partly because we couldn't get the surface um, even enough for it to crumple properly. There were, there, it turns out there's all kinds of problems with that. And so some other projects that you did uh, at the uh, Eli Whitney bar no, yeah. was uh, remembering memories. Because mm -hmm. one thing that you did was to try to, before you arrive, the display case here was sadly empty. It was and sadly empty. Dust. It was really sad. And so that was one of my yeah. main uh, issue with it, was that we should do something about mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And when you uh, met with different scientists, you find a lot of treasure in boxes covered with us and I think and I mentioned I'm interested in the history of science and, and in, in these various offices were remnants and the, the history of this place hasn't been uh, dealt with and I started, I, I tried to make a stab at starting that. Um, this is a relatively new institute uh, but there are all kinds of objects that do have to do with its past and so I spent some time uh, gathering objects and trying to get the labels right from various people. Luigi was very helpful. Uh, Professor Wolf, I believe, collected most of the, the objects. Um, so I tried to get the provenance of them and clean them off and put them up in the cases. And that was another way of interacting with the people here. There were some people who were perhaps reluctant to speak with me or shy or um, didn't know how. Anyway, my, one of the ways that I, I could talk to people was through the display cases. So put things up, move things around. Um, and one of the first objects that I found was outside of Michelle's lab. Uh, in the case there was a piece of magnetic core memory, which is a slice of a, a computer that would have uh, taken up an entire room. And the memory itself is hand-woven copper wires that um, have a fairly elaborate weave pattern. Uh, the copper wires have been coated with a kind of red lacquer, and at each intersection is a small uh, magnetic torus, a small magnetic ring. And one of the defining features of 
uh, core, magnetic core memory is that it, it retains the last memory of what you've asked it to remember until you ask it to remember something else again. So even within this tiny slice of this very old computer is a bit of whatever it was that you asked it to remember last time. And there's something I find incredibly moving about that. Not only is there this beautiful hand labor on these tiny woven pieces, um, that are layered and you kind of can't see them. There's all this hand work on it, um, but also that it, that, it's, that it still has this memory. Um, so I cleaned it off and put it up there and Michelle helped me get a, um, a diagram of the weaving pattern and I tried to research uh, who wove it and that was trickier and it turned out that there's a sort of whole secret history. Um, so in the Midwest, there were, there were back rooms that where the girls were, or the less politely, they were talking about older women in the back who were, who were busy making these things or tiny hands were making it. Um, apparently, and I don't know this, I don't know too much about this, but apparently Native American groups were also brought in to do some of the weaving, and this piece was apparently made in, in Asia somewhere, and more than that, I don't know. Um, but it definitely had to be skilled people doing it, and I can attest to that because I made a large version of the weaving pattern uh, at the historic Eli Whitney Barn as a part of Open Studios. I made, it, I made the piece into an installation called Remembering Memory where you could see the actual piece, but also I made a large weaving using the barn as a loom and wove the pattern and had uh, the magnets and, and spent time doing the pattern itself um, so you could actually visit it. It was a kind of Zen garden about memory, about our own memory. And you know, now we've all had, I think we've, everybody in this room has probably had a computer that's died and the memory has gone away or you've lost things that you really loved in an instant. Um, but with this, you wouldn't entirely remember it. It's more like our own memory where most of the time it just slowly, like bits of it get eroded and removed. Um, and as I get older, I think a lot about that. Um, so the piece had to do with that as well. Um, but the, that object, it was, it was incredibly poignant to me. And I think you can tell from the way I'm talking about it, there, there are these sort of layers of association that go in with my work. So I'm not just enacting what the piece does as a kind of illustration. It gets, it gets uh, a quite nuanced and somewhat abstract treatment. And so your your work until then was very uh, low tech. It is very low tech, paper, yeah. Ink, yeah. Uh, Overhead press. projector on that one. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. since then, it did we rub <laughs> technology on you? Yes. And because everything gets really uh, mm -hmm. more high. Um, I don't think we can call that high tech well, because we're high developing tech, no. a quantum computer in the no. next room. But right. uh, it's it definitely has more technology. It does. It does. And I would. I'm delighted that there's so many people here, but I would ask you to please be careful of the objects that you're near, by the way. Uh, <laughs> nervous. Um, so the technology has made this thing incredibly fiddly. I've been so lucky. Uh, <laughs> Stefan Krastanoff over there is our tech wizard for this, and he's been wonderful and generous and creative and has helped make all of the motion sensors and the diagram, and really it's, you know. So one of the nice things about this is Scientists work in collaborative teams. Everybody here works in collaborative teams. And I can imagine that there are problems with that. People have different ideas, and there are probably fights every now and then. Um, but mostly as an artist, I work by myself, and I'm in my studio. And I, I do talk to other artists about what I'm doing, and we, we kind of back and forth, and it's very helpful. But this is really different, because you know what Stefan contributed is completely different than what I contributed, and what Michelle contributed is completely different. And together, it makes the whole. So it's, it really is our piece. Um, so it's the, jointly published. It's jointly published. It is. It is. And I love that. And, that, and that's another thing that makes this really different. Not only is, is it more high tech, and, and I'm going to go into that in a second, but, but also just the way that it was made is really different than how I make things. And for me, as a, this, this has really, um, I've been really pushing myself in different ways this year. Some of the things that I've been making are successful and some of them are not, but, but this is one of the things that's really quite different and I wanted, I wanted to have these different exper experiences. And I left you out of it, but, but you've been helping a lot with the I installation. I should not, no, no, that was just, 
That was a mistake. Florian's helped a lot with it as <laughs> well. Right. He's part of the team. <laughs> and he, he did all of the GIFs and animation and has been unbelievable in putting this together. Um, however, there are reasons why I haven't worked with technology before, and I would still stand by those ideas. Uh, if technology can fail, it does. It's been really fiddly. I made something that evokes one of these fridges in the labs, and now I actually feel like I have my own fridge because every morning I get up on that ladder and I've got pliers and I've got <laughs> pins and I'm taping and carefully, you know, trying not to breathe as I move these tiny parts around, trying to get it to. to Keep going. Um, and if, if anything can go wrong, it will only be with the technology. Um, the piece itself basically should just function with you and it, um, but it doesn't because it's got technology. So, um, <laughs> so that part about it is is the is um, the part that makes me kind of nervous. But I, you know, it's an interesting experience having it like this, and and it's I have I have people, so it's um, I don't have to worry about it in quite the same way. Entropy. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Uh, can we talk about the diagram on the ceiling? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I know it's a graphical representation that you come up with, Michelle. Yeah. Do you want to talk about uh, why it's interesting to have your the scientific meaning of this in the art and how it can help uh, scientists to maybe see another, another facet of this work instead of seeing uh, a graphic somewhere in a publication or some equation somewhere? Yes, yeah. yeah, so um, at... Um, if you look at the ceiling, and uh, the ceiling as, uh, of the installation as a diagram, actually. Um, and uh, if you want to have a, a more abstract version of this diagram, there's a poster on the wall on, on the left. It's also on the, light, uh, yeah. the whiteboard there. There's a drawing yes. of it. And um, this diagram is uh, an interpretation of, um, of an experimental proposal, um, which has been... Um, um, elaborated by two physicists, uh, uh, Mermin and Perez, uh, and they came up uh, with this kind of um, sort of diagram to introduce um, um, a phenomenon in quantum mechanics uh, which is called uh, contextuality, which is re um, actually related. Uh, it's a subtle form of this observer effect that we talked about. So the diagram um, consists of um, different um, edges, uh, different links uh, that are between nodes. Uh, and these links uh, indicate that uh, whatever uh, the nodes uh, indicate, so the, 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 the nodes represent measurements that you could do. And um, uh, a link between these nodes uh, mean that uh, these measurements are compatible. You can measure this quantity and that quantity uh, if they are linked. Uh, and uh, you won't perturb them, or at least a measurement of one will not perturb the measurement of the other. But if you uh, go to another uh, quantity, uh, which is not linked uh, to uh, the, those you have already measured, then uh, the first ones you have measured will be erased. And um, basically, it is the, this idea that um, the, the system evolves as you measure it. And um, actually, what we have represented here is a diagram of an experiment that has uh, never been done in, in uh, physics yet. So it is simulated here. And maybe someday, uh, in the next few years, we'll be able to make that, uh, to do that experiment. But, uh, uh, from the time being, you, you will live through a simulation of that uh, quantum experiment. And actually, if you walk through the installation, there's a sensor and cameras that represent this uh, observer effect, and you will influence the color patterns. And you're basically part of the experiment. And thank you for joining us for this experiment. <laughs> And basically, the whole installation, even the non-electronic parts, interact with you. So, the um, the curtains, the the leaf, the metal leaf, which is gold and copper leaf, um, all of it is is moving with you. You will notice that the the curtains they have they're fraying at the edges, and that they kind of ripple like a wave across the carpeting, and they're actually coming apart. As, as you move by them, they're, 
there are, the, your movement is, is part of their lifetime. And one interesting thing about this installation is that you cannot really solve uh, if no. you, the, the diagram. No. You're trying to, if you try to get every property in your system, you will run it's into yeah. uh, an incompatibility where, for example, in this stage, it has to be, uh, so it, the property is represented by color, so it's either red or blue. And at some point, one of the triangle, one of the edge of the triangle has to be red and has to be blue. And so you run into this uh, superposition of states. And I think that's a very interesting way to represent that because when we think about uh, superposition of states, we usually think about Schrodinger cats sitting on a box and mm -hmm. being dead and alive at the same time. And I think this example is everywhere, and this is why we have so many cats around. We uh, have so many cats around because they're, they're cute right and we like them yeah. anyway. Um, yeah. But. Uh, the, I think like you would like prefer the them alive. alive. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's that's a good note. Uh, but c can you both talk about uh, how using art uh, to represent something that is hard to wrap your head around? Do yeah. you, Do you think that that helps uh, visualing something and and using? Do I think? Yes. Oh, I mean, both of you. I mean, I, I can't even imagine trying to understand things without making a visualization of them. Um, Yes, and I'm particularly compelled by diagrams, which are pictures of something without being an illustration of something, and having a diagram blown up so that you can actually move through it and move your body through it um, is particularly uh, helpful, moving, and, and useful for understanding things. So, well, um, can I uh, yeah. say something now? So, so. Uh, yes, so um, so you are all aware of, um, or most of you are aware of this uh, Schrodinger cat metaphor. So Schrodinger was a bit of a poet when he invented uh, this metaphor. So um, a few moments ago, I, I uh, tried to explain the superposition uh, principle with this uh, very modest object, uh, this mock cover, but. Um, in order to to transmit uh, to the general public how counterintuitive uh, the superposition principle is, um, Schrodinger devised this uh, comparison where it was not just uh, an object which would be in uh, two places at the same time. It was a cat which was both uh, dead and alive. Um, you know, it makes uh, the story more poignant. It does also. Um, some relationship with uh, Alice in Wonderland, mm -hmm. and uh, it it has, uh, the, yeah. and that's why you will see uh, cats uh, smiling, uh, in, uh, smiling and disappearing, <laughs> and disappearing in the installation. Yeah. Yes. Can I, can I add something um, to this point about visualization? Yeah. Uh, because I think historically. Uh, so I wrote a book about the beginning of quantum mm -hmm. mechanics. You'll see a little this is Douglas display Stone. about it uh, in the back right there. And, um, you know, the, probably hard for people to imagine, but if you're starting in 1900, at that point, they knew there were atoms, but they really had no idea how they behaved. And the simple idea was they might just behave like billiard balls and macroscopic objects uh, and so on. And that idea began to fail, you know, sort of dramatically over the next uh, 25 years, so that we finally had to change this very uh, more complex and interesting view of what's going down on in the um, un, you know, in the unseen world of the atom. So, uh, but the interesting thing is that by about 1923, they've been trying to get this to work for over 20 years, and and it they really didn't have the theory. So people started to say, this is impossible for human beings, that we can't visualize something that we can't see. Mm -hmm. It's so small, it's so hard to you know, interact with with our senses that it's unvisualizable mm -hmm. and, and we will never have a theory of the atom. And really, really famous physicists said this out loud. Okay, so, and then it turned out just two, three years later, the secret was cracked with Schrodinger and Heisenberg and mm -hmm. Einstein and so on, and, uh, and, and we came up with a mathematical description and then a lot of different visualization tools as well. 
But it, it should be appreciated that this was a sort of boundary for the whole concept of visualization. You know, the, the atom was sort of beyond direct sense experience. Could humans get down there yeah. and understand it? And, and, and mankind did that. It's one of the great achievements of our civilization. So I, I think this, this question is kind of touches on that. Yeah, no, that's a really great point. And actually, I read a lot of popular science books that are meant for lay people. And a lot of them have been saying this something similar about quantum physics, which is literally that it's that it's unvisualizable. And one of the ways that I've been kind of skating around that, or not skating around it, but trying to deal with it, is to not um, not actually create. I'm creating images without um, without creating images, if that makes any sense. I'm using diagrams that 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 scientists have created. I'm using tropes like Schrodinger's cat um, and the act and using the actual objects that are involved with the experiments but um, and this is an image that is new that's behind you but it's not like I'm um, making another metaphor or analogy and that's intentional and that's probably something that uh, more and more institute and department are doing, uh, mm -hmm. trying to welcome artists. And uh, there's, there's grants that uh, share funds between artists and scientists. Uh, there's an entire institute dedicated to that. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you uh, feel about this, this new push? It seems that uh, it's, it looks from the outside as we're trying to share uh, the resources that become scarce. Yes. But I think it's much more than that. I think it's much more than that. So like I was saying before, when I, when I watch people using the whiteboards or the way that there are these sort of self-generated projects, I feel like there's a, there's a lot of conversation that can be had between artists and scientists already. And also, I feel like for whatever reason in Western culture, art has been removed um, and put in its, artists are in their studios, they're working by themselves, they're outside of the culture at large. And in fact, um, art is social glue, it's how we talk about things, and it's part of life, and artists need to get out <laughs> and about and, and be in lots of different kinds of places. And one of the places that they can be is within scientific institutions.